Uh, Boris Johnson has been inside this RAF base this afternoon on the other side of a, a rather high fence up here in the northeast of Scotland. And earlier on, he was in remote Orkney talking up the case for the union, making the link with the pandemic response in Scotland. Why? Well, surely he's seen the polling showing continued support for independence. Next year, there are crucial Holyrood elections and a big SNP majority would make it harder for Boris Johnson to continue to resist a referendum as he did again today. And of course, there is no love lost between Boris Johnson and Nicola Sturgeon. And even by those standards, her response to his visit today was remarkably blunt. And it does feel like the moment that the pandemic became part of this independence debate. Boris Johnson on Orkney, armed with a crab and an argument that nowhere is out of reach of the UK government's coronavirus response. The merits of, of, of the union are very, very strong. Uh, they've, they've been proved uh, throughout this crisis and uh, what we want to do now is, uh, why I'm here in Orkney, is, is to show how we can not just deal with the health crisis, but work to deal with the, the economic uh, consequences together, building back better, investing in, in green technology and a green recovery. Something of a reboot then of the case for the union from a man for whom Scotland is hardly his happy place. His Tories lost almost half their Scottish seats in the general election, and it's the SNP and Nicola Sturgeon who have momentum. The First Minister likes to say politics has no place at this public health podium, but the question was asked, and it was a stinging response. The Prime Minister has been talking directly about the pandemic response, and he has said that it has shown the sheer might of the union in Scotland. Do you think he has a point? Uh, look, no, no, I don't, um, and for a couple of reasons. Uh, as I've said, some of the things I think he references are simply a feature of where power lies. If, if Scotland was an independent country, then just like Ireland or many of the other small countries, we'd be doing these things ourselves. I just don't think any of us should be championing and celebrating a pandemic that has taken thousands of lives as some you know, example of, of the, the, the pre-existing political case we want to make. None of us should be crowing um, about this pandemic in a political sense, is my, my honest opinion. As we listen to the First Minister, saltire-clad campaigners emerge to welcome the Prime Minister as he touches down in the Kinloss army barracks. Are you persuaded at all by the argument that the UK government, in its response to the pandemic, has shown the value, the merits? <laughs> of the United Kingdom. 65,000 deaths. It's everything becomes comes out of his mouth, it's just lies. It's just a buffoon now. He's got no respect for Scotland or its people. These folks don't waver on the independence question. But in the Bridge of Allen, in the Stirling constituency, the Tories lost to the SNP in the recent general election that voted more no than yes for independence in 2014. Are there signs of a shift? Well, yes. Are you willing to give independence consideration now? I'd give it more consideration. Really? Against my... Would have thought my better judgment. And no. She hasn't Absolutely. actually got to sit down Absolutely. and work out how she's going to pay for this and Absolutely. how she's going to pay for that. I'm detecting that neither of you have particularly changed your mind since the last time you were asked this question in 2014. Boris Johnson and his advisers will be only too aware that polling, for all its limitations, is showing support for independence, for yes over no, gradually ticking up over the last year and a half from the high 40s through the 50% mark, and now this year near continued majority support for independence. In terms of the polling on independence, have we ever seen anything like this before? Well, we've never previously had a consistent series of polls, on average, putting yes ahead. We are in uncharted waters, and therefore perhaps it's not surprising uh, that the Prime Minister decided that maybe it's time to begin to try to raise the flag for the Union north of the border, because that flag does seem to have got a little bit uh, tattered and battered in the course of the last year or so. 
why? Professor Curtis points first to Brexit, which Scotland voted 62% against, and now to seemingly better perceptions of Nicola Sturgeon's handling of the pandemic, even though deaths overall, if not lately, are at worrying levels in Scotland as in England. Yeah. We pulled some serious Gs. I have pulled up to 9G. Had they pulled some serious Gs, the Prime Minister asked, from within RAF Lossy Mouth's protective ring. It seems he has concluded the case for the union in Scotland requires similar thrust. So how will Brexit play into all of this and how are those vital talks between Britain and the EU going? The latest round ended in deadlock this afternoon and time is running out to find a deal that will avoid tariffs and quotas being imposed on cross-channel trade at the end of the year. Our political editor Gary Gibbon joins us from Westminster. Gary. Well, as Kieran was saying there, different perceptions in Scotland uh, and England of, of who's handling uh, COVID best. Uh, they seem to be driving the latest burst in support for independence, but it is layered, as Kieran said, on top of the Brexit fault line. You talk to strategists in the unionist uh, camp and in the nationalist camp, and they're quite clear the cohort of voters that are making the journey uh, over to the independent side are pretty exclusively uh, pro-Remain. So how these talks go uh, it could be quite critical to uh, their journey. And if we were to come out of the transition uh, and crash out with no deal, well, then that would cause even more disruption, potentially uh, uh, tariffs. Uh, it would throw the light onto Brexit, which wouldn't help uh, the cause uh, at all, probably, of unionism. And it would make the UK government look a bit ragged, playing into the perception that some people in Scotland are building up over the Covid uh, saga anyway. How are those talks going? Well, as you say, they crashed through a deadline today. This was meant to be a moment when they were coming together to come up with a deal. And you get a flavour of what the two sides think of that uh, in these uh, comments from the two chief negotiators. A less ambitious agreement on goods and services will not lead the EU to drop its demands for a robust level playing field. On fishery, the UK is effectively asking for a near total exclusion of EU fishing vessels from UK waters. That is simply unacceptable. It's clear that until the EU has internalised and accepted that we will be an independent state with the right to determine our own laws, control our own fishing grounds, then it will be difficult to reach an agreement. Well, you would think, listening to the two of them, that their poles apart, nothing can be done. But, as I say, the, the number 10 forces are very conscious of the way this would play into the Scottish debate. And for that reason, uh, there's even more pressure to come to a deal. And a late deal does give uh, the advantage, they think, to them in that it gives less time for the EU to push back and try to extract more concessions. And maybe it gives less time to the people behind them, their own back, uh, the, the Brexiteers, to uh, voice their discontent with whatever concessions they've made. So or, despite the rhetoric there, and partly because of Scotland, don't rule out a late deal. Gary Gibbon in Westminster. Well, joining me here now, the deputy leader of the SNP, Keith Brown, and the Scottish Conservative MP for Moray, Douglas Ross, whose constituency the Prime Minister Boris Johnson visited today, joins us over the internet. Um, Douglas Ross, smacks of desperation this, doesn't it a little? I mean, I'm surprised that you wanted Boris Johnson in your constituency, given how unpopular he is in Scotland. You, after all, resigned over the behaviour of Dominic Cummings from the government. Well, I think it was very good to see the Prime Minister back in Murray for the second time in just eight months. Uh, and that is in stark contrast to the First Minister of Scotland, who hasn't been here in her official capacity for almost two years. And it just shows how seriously the Prime Minister takes representing and getting out to every part of the United Kingdom. And just two points from the earlier uh, introduction. The Prime Minister wasn't just at RAF Ossiemouth, where he was thanking the troops and also at Kimmel's Barracks, but he was on a factory visit with me at Baxter's, where he was cheered and waved by employees and, and spoke to local uh, people and, and engaged with them. Uh, and also, these visits had been planned for some time, but because of COVID, they couldn't happen. So this is not a knee-jerk reaction to opinion polls. This is the Prime Minister getting out and about in the United Kingdom and showing people in Scotland that we have two governments that can work together working for them. Well, why do you think support for independence is so high? 
Well, Nicola Sturgeon herself has said support for independence has risen when the topic of independence and separating Scotland for the rest of the United Kingdom has not been at the top of the agenda. And I think the more people consider uh, the huge benefits of remaining part of a strong United Kingdom, £13 billion of investment by the UK government directly into Scotland during this pandemic, and when they look at the fragile case for separation that the SNP continue to put forward, that may refocus minds and we could see a shift again. But there's no doubt the importance of the Union, the United Kingdom, uh, is at the top of everyone's minds within the UK government. And I think we are going to see more and more of these visits by the Prime Minister, by senior members and others in the Cabinet to reiterate our message about how strong we are together as four nations in the United Kingdom. Uh, Keith Brown, are you benefiting from the fact, as Douglas Ross suggests, that nobody's concentrating on the downsides of independence? Because you're not talking about it. Well, it's funny you should say that, because in the 2014 referendum, we started off around the low 20 support for independence, and by the time you got to the referendum, we're at 45%. So I think we'll see further increases. But, of course, people are aware of the fact how good a job Nicola Sturgeon's been doing, and they contrast that with Boris Johnson. As you said, Douglas Ross had to resign because he said his constituents were being told one thing and the government was doing something else. But so didn't Nicola Sturgeon make all the same mistakes early on? Uh, no, you know, she failed to heed the lessons from the Far East. She failed to lock down as well until March. I mean, it, it was only after we were well into this uh, pandemic that she started doing things differently. Well, it's funny, that's a kind of Tory narrative which says, on well, the one the hand, it, well, the Tories have been saying, you're only doing a few things slightly different, and now they're saying the things that you've done are really down to the Tory government. You can't have it both ways. I think she's been clear, consistent, and very transparent. And we contrast it with Boris Johnson, taking endless questions every single day from journalists across the country on what she's been doing, being very clear, clear and transparent. And today, instead, you've got Boris Johnson coming here talking about the mighty union when he should be focusing on the pandemic. That's what's foremost in people's minds. And the reason he's here, of course, is because he's worried sick about what he knows is coming, which is a referendum on independence for Scotland. Uh, Douglas Ross? Uh, well, I doubt that is coming, given that Nicola Sturgeon herself, as Deputy First Minister, said that referendum was a once-in-a-generation vote. And people in Scotland uh, don't like being taken for granted. People here in Murray voted comprehensively to remain part of the United Kingdom. And they expect both governments to follow the will of the people uh, just six years ago. Six years is not a generation. Well, of course, the Tories and their Labour partners said that the only way to guarantee Scotland's place in the EU was to vote no in the referendum. And look, we're now being taken out of the EU. The ready meal, the oven ready deal that Boris Johnson was going to produce is burnt to a crisp in the oven. And we're looking at businesses and individuals paying billions of pounds for the cost of Brexit. So the Tories have not stuck to the word that they said, which is the only way to guarantee Scotland's place in the EU, supported by nearly two thirds of the people in Scotland, was going to be guaranteed by a no vote. That's not happened, and people have got the Right to cast the vote again. So, I mean, isn't the truth that everything that happens politically in the United Kingdom is something that politically you can be pleased with? I mean, obviously, I mean, no one would suggest that you would be pleased with the pandemic, but you've, you've benefited from it politically. And as Brexit approaches and the likelihood of no deal goes up, you will benefit from that as well. Well, I think the simple fact is nobody saw uh, the outcome of this pandemic, but I think people, how people respond to it is really important. I'm not going to apologise for the fact that Nicholas Sturgeon has been an extremely competent uh, leader at this time and Boris Johnson has been disastrous. All the mistakes that have been made, uh, not least with the Dominic Cummings situation, where they trashed their own public health advice to save a special adviser. And that's despite all the U-turns that we've had as well. But as you repeat this claim that. that there's this massive contrast, do you not accept that Nicholas Sturgeon made the same mistake early on? that she did not lock down this country when she should have done. Well, lockdown was not completely within her gift. She couldn't guarantee the furlough scheme because those powers rest currently with the UK government. And what we're seeing yeah, But you didn't have to wait for the furlough scheme well, to lock down. To have a lockdown, of course, if you're going to guarantee people's income as part of that. But she did take action earlier than the UK government on a number of but things. Are you saying you wanted to? Are you saying you wanted to lock down before, but, if but you couldn't because couldn't. the further scheme well, wasn't course, in place? Of course you don't have the same powers as other governments to do that. But she did act in, in advance of the UK government in a number of respects, whether it was in terms of masks or various other measures. And you can see that in the evidence. You can see that in the figures which are produced every day. Douglas Ross, I mean, even today, England is still playing catch-up with Scotland, isn't it, on face masks? I mean, it, it is true that after the beginning of April, Scotland's been way ahead of the game. Uh, no, it's absolutely not true, and Keith Brown is grasping at straws to suggest that, and he continues to deny what you are quite legitimately putting to him, that the Scottish Government and the UK Government have been pretty much in lockstep throughout this pandemic. And just on face masks, for example, they were mandatory on public transport in 
England before there were mandatory in public transport uh, in Scotland and in shops. So a lot of the time, Nicola Sturgeon and the... But the advice preceded it by weeks. ...things are very different in Scotland, when actually she has followed the UK and the decisions made by the UK government uh, almost... Well, we must leave it there. Douglas Ross uh, and uh, Mr Brown, thank you very much indeed.